This video is about log transimpedance amplifiers. It corresponds to section 23.2 of the Applied Analog Electronics textbook. Now, log transimpedance amplifiers are a somewhat specialized circuit, but a very useful one. And I'm going to first try to motivate them and then uh, give you the circuit for them and then show you why the circuit works. Okay, the motivation Let's start with a fairly simple problem. We're trying to measure pulse optically. So we're shining light through the finger and we've got a you know, light on one side, sensor on the other side, and the sensor is measuring how much light gets through. Now, what's actually varying, what we're really interested in is how opaque the finger is. And that's a function of you know, how much blood is there, how much uh, the blood cells are absorbing light. And that amount that gets absorbed, basically you can think of it as uh, the amount of light that comes through some fraction of the amount of light that shines on the finger. So if you put on a really bright light, let's say 1% of the light gets through, or maybe 1 to 1.1% of the light. Okay. If you put a dim light, then that difference between 1% and 1.1% is a tiny difference. If you put a really bright light, then the difference between 1% and 1.1% of the bright light might be a big difference. And this is where we run into problems with our standard circuits for dealing with phototransistors and things like that, is that they're linear sensors. So the amount of current we get from the phototransistor is just dependent on how much light there is there. And so when you have a, a very dim light, you have small current, and then a very much slightly larger current. So, small change. And then when you have a bright light, you have much larger current, and, you know, slightly larger current when, when it's uh, letting more light through. So, the problem is, if we use the standard circuit, um, let's switch over to the, to the desk. Um, if we use the standard circuit that we've been, uh, doing for things like phototransistors, and that is um, taking a transimpedance amplifier. All right, here's our phototransistor, um, and we have current flowing this way. The voltage across the phototransistor is just going to be the copy of the bias voltage here, VREF. The current is going to be the, whatever the photocurrent is for that phototransistor. And the output voltage is just going to be R times I plus VREF because the node here on the negative side is being held at VREF. So our gain is R. All right, what happens here if we have very uh, dim light? Well, then we'll have 1% or 1.1% of that dim light coming through, and we'll multiply that by R. We'll have a small voltage here. If we have a very bright light, then I is very much larger. 1% to 1.1% change is going to be a much larger fluctuation in voltage. But we're going to have to keep R fairly small to avoid V out hitting the top rail, to avoid clipping. So we, if we've got possibility of having bright light, we have to make R small. But if R is small, then we're going to only have a tiny voltage change here when the light is dim. And so we get something where the signal, the opacity signal that we're interested in, fluctuates, but be tiny, tiny fluctuations in dim light and very large fluctuations in bright light. And that's not what really what we want. We would like to have the opacity signal, the thing we're actually interested in, resulting in the same size fluctuations no matter what um, the brightness, the overall brightness of the light is. So whether we're doing this outside in the sunlight or indoors with just candlelit illumination. Um, and that can be a huge difference in light, by the way. Full sunlight can be like a thousand watts per square meter. Kilowatt per square meter is a, quite a bit of energy. That's why solar panels work. Um, whereas the candle might be 0.1 to 1 watt per square meter. So it's 
very much less, a thousand, ten thousand times less light. And you don't really want your signals to change in strength by factors of ten thousand. You have a really hard time doing any sort of uh, uh, digitization of them or anything because you have, I mean, your your analog to digital converters you'll be down to only one least significant bit or less on the dim signals. So signal processing and stuff gets really difficult if your signals have such a huge dynamic range. Well, here we can borrow some ideas from biology because you have to handle this problem yourself. Um, your body has to handle it and your sensors because you are able to see things in full sunlight and you're able to see things in moonlight, which is quite a bit dimmer. Um, and that huge dynamic range that you have and the, how much light uh, things are doing is something your body compensates for. You can see uh, things in bright light or room light, or not quite when you get down to moonlight, then th things start getting a little bit different because your color perception starts going away. But um, things look pretty much the same under different lighting conditions. Um, and the reason for that is what you're looking at is the reflectance, which is basically um, how much light is being reflected off the surface. Your uh, visual system compensates for the overall light level and just is looking at sort of the relative light levels um, and the ratios of them rather than absolute differences. Same thing with your hearing. Uh, when you increase the power by a factor of 10, it goes up by a certain amount of loudness. You increase the power powered by another factor of 10, and it seems to have gotten about as much louder again. It's um, Everything's behaving as if it was a logarithmic scale rather than a linear scale. So if we could replace this resistor with something whose voltage drop was logarithmic rather than linear, so instead of voltage being proportional to R, R times I, um, or proportional to I, I should say, R times I, um, we want something that is the voltage is logarithmic in I. So if we get a very much larger signal, we're still looking just at the log of it. And then what we'll be interested in, differences in voltage here, the sorts of things that we actually measure with the analog digital converter, are coming as a result, of, would be coming as a result of ratios of current here rather than differences of current. So what we want is something where voltage is logarithmic with current. How do we get that? Well. Now I'll give you the circuit for a log trans impedance amplifier and then try and explain how it works. What we're going to do, it's still going to be a trans impedance amplifier of sorts, so we're still going to have V ref here uh, coming in on the plus input and the minus input is still going to go to our phototransistor. The difference here is that instead of a resistor for the feedback device, we're going to do a semiconductor diode. Now notice the current is still flowing in the same direction and so this is the forward biased diode. Well how much current do we get from a forward biased diode? So if we're looking at um, the diode drop, let's say if this is V out then the voltage across the diode VD is V out minus V ref. We would like that to be logarithmic in the current, or another way of expressing that is we would like the current to be exponential in that voltage. It turns out that's how diodes behave. There is something called the Shockley model, that says that the current through the diode is going to be e to the diode voltage over NVT and then minus one there. That minus one is just so that when you get a uh, diode voltage of zero, E to the zero is going to be one, so one minus one is zero. You, when you have a diode voltage of zero, you get a current of zero. Then there's going to be one more thing out here, a scaling factor for the current, because this thing here is unitless. Notice I have VD and VT, those are both vol in volts, so this is unitless and is uh, unitless. So e to the something here is going to be unitless, minus 1, still unitless, but I need something in amps. So I have a scaling factor here. This scaling factor is essentially measuring how big the diode is. So 
the exponential part here is measuring general properties of this sort of diode, what the semiconductor does. And the um, scaling factor here, I sub s, is just how big is the diode. Make a tiny diode, it's going to have a small amount of current. Make a really big fat diode, it's going to have a larger current for the same voltage. Okay. Um, I haven't explained n and vt yet. v sub t is a temperature-dependent voltage, and um, it is actually coming from physics. It's the Boltzmann's constant times the temp absolute temperature divided by the charge of an electron, the charge of the carriers in your semiconductor, technically. Um, so this is this is coming from real physics. Um, the n is a fudge factor. It's called the ideality of the diode. And if this was a perfect, beautiful physics thing, it would be one. In practice, it isn't. Um, and so it's a fudge factor that says, how is this differing from the ideal uh, Shockley model? Um, and so it's, it's just basically measured. It, it depends on properties of the, se of the semiconductor, and it may be something that's computable by quantum mechanics. I don't know. Um, but uh, in practice, you just measure it. Okay, so this is looking kind of like we have an exponential. We have current is, well, there's an exponential with respect to the voltage there, but there's this minus one here kind of messing things up. Well, we can ignore that minus one if the diode voltage is much bigger than this NVT. And so how big is NVT? Well, that's something, again, uh, temperature dependent. So obviously, if you make this thing colder, it's smaller. Um, in fact, this temperature dependence is how the um, diode-based uh, temperature detectors that we talked about way back at the beginning of the course, um, that's how they work, is that this temperature dependence uh, is something that you can actually use for measuring the temperature of the diode. Um, but if you're looking at about room temperature and you're looking at silicon diodes, which is generally what we end up using for things like this, um, we're going to get uh, NVT is going to be approximately, oh, I don't know, about 26 millivolts at 25 degrees C. All right, so f as long as our voltage is more than about 26 millivolts, particularly if it's a substantially more than that, then this e to the vd over nvt is going to be much larger than 1. And we can then kind of ignore the minus 1. And we can say approximately, i is approximately that scaling factor times e to the vd over nvt. And that is the uh, behavior that we want to use for this log transimpedance amplifier. So this diode is going to be uh, translating whatever the current through it is, the current that we're getting from our sensor, into um, uh, V out by basically taking this formula, turning it around to get a logarithm, um, taking that diode drop and adding it to V ref. And what that means is that now if we have fluctuations in the current, ratios of those fluctuations are going to be translated into differences in voltage. And so the opacity signal that we'd be getting from a pulse monitor would be the same size signal no matter whether we've got bright light shining through the finger or dim light shining through the finger. There'll be a DC offset based on this thing, but changes in current will result in uh, Changes that are ratio changes will result in uh, changes that are differences in voltage. Let's take a look um, at um, some measurements I made for a diode to see whether or not this exponential behavior really is visible, or whether this is just sort of a, oh, this is an ideal model, but it doesn't really work. Um, and it's always something you have to worry about when you're looking at models that are given in books and stuff. Physicists like to simplify things, and sometimes the, the simplifications are just 
beautiful models that apply really well over a wide range of things. And sometimes they just, well, there's a narrow range where you can sort of apply that, but it doesn't really work where we want it. So we need to check. So I made a bunch of measurements and I made measurements using different sense resistors. I did this quite some time ago. Um, and what I have here is a logarithmic scale on the x-axis and a linear scale on the y-axis. So if I have a logarithmic function here, if voltage is the logarithm of the current, I should get a straight line. And it's not quite a straight line. If you notice, when you get up to very large currents, there's a little bit of curvature up there at the sort of the purple end. And down at the really low end, it's hard to tell whether it's a straight line or not because when the currents are getting that small, it's hard to avoid getting noise in the measurements. And so I'm not sure that the measurements down there are really perfectly accurate. But for the range in which I could measure it, which is like a six decade range here from um, what 10 uh, nanoamps there at the bottom end up to um, looks like about 10 milliamps at the upper end uh, before I get into the curvature. So over about six decades, that looks like a pretty good straight line. And you can approximate it as basically the voltage of the logarithm of the current over a pretty big range. Um, so um, this, is, this is actually doable. You actually can make diodes behave in a way that gets some logarithmic response. And that means that the log trans impedance amplifier really does compute a pretty good logarithm. Now, the problem, of course, is that you don't have any control over what NVT is. Pro property of the diode and of the temperature. Um, and so your lo log trans impedance amplifier will have different gain at different temperatures. Now, if you keep the temperature in a pretty narrow range, that doesn't matter. Um, if you're doing something, for instance, that uh, keeping it at body temperature because it's, you know, your finger's right next to it or something, not a big deal. Uh, but if you, if you do get concerned about that, then you might have to do something where you adjust the gain in later stages based on the temperature of the diode. Um, and so if, if you've got something where you really care for precise logarithmic computation, you have to do some temperature compensation. We're not going to worry about that because for the stuff we're interested in, we just want to have a big enough signal and the fluctuation in opacity of the finger that we get from the pulse is we don't need to know exactly what how much fluctuation there is we need we want to look at the the pattern of the fluctuation we want to look at the the rate things like that but we're not really interested in does it go from one percent to 1.1 percent or did it go to from one percent to 1.09 percent that sort of measurement is not what we're interested in and because of that we can ignore temperature compensation and just say, hey, over the temperature range from you know, 20 degrees to 40 degrees, which is, that's Celsius, um, there's not gonna be that big a change in the absolute temperature and the difference in the gain um, from that, uh, going back to the Shockley model here, from the um, NVT here. I gave it at 25 degrees C, and you can see it's gonna go up as, um, the temperature rises, which means um, that this number here is also going up. We're going to have a slightly different slope to that straight line. Um, but we can ignore that for the stuff we're doing and just treat it all as being at a constant temperature. Okay, I think that's probably enough for now on um, log trans impedance amplifiers. <laughs>